Seasons change quickly as they appear Air gets crisp this time of year As the summer moves on the dreamers love has to wait The winter's chill warms the embers of a once burning flame Give me a love, let me in your song Give me that fire that you need me to hold Give me a love, let me in your song I'm Father Burl Salmon, and I am the associate for pastoral care, Christian formation, and outreach at the Church of Bethesda by the Sea. And that's a long title, but what that means is that, um, first of all, I make sure that everybody is tended to. That's the role of a pastor, that if somebody's in the hospital, that I make sure that person is seen um, as the person who's in charge of Christian formation. I then make sure that there are substantive opportunities for developing faith. And then finally, um, as the person in charge of outreach on staff, I make sure that we are Christ's hands and feet in the world as much as we can be. We are so grateful to benefit from um, the resources of the church mouse that we are able to minister to the world uh, around the corner and around the world, as we like to say, with funds generated from the church mouse um, in all sorts of areas. And we prioritize our areas at Bethesda into um, education and shelter and food. So those three areas are the areas that we support um, in our outreach ministries here at Bethesda by the Sea. Bethesda has continued its grant process this year. So we we maintain relationships with organizations that care for people directly, that have one-on-one contact with the most vulnerable in our society, whether it's through feeding ministries or it's through sheltering ministries. And we usually, we often have volunteer opportunities. We will continue to do that. In fact, we are beginning a whole new relationship with the Palenka Food Pantry at Holy Redeemer Episcopal Church in Lake Worth, where we will be volunteering, where we are hands-on, as we have done at St. George's in Riviera Beach for so very long. Because the need is so real. We will host our eighth annual Empty Bowls on February the 26th. And it might not look the same as it has in years past. The need still exists. There are still hungry people in Palm Beach County. And we will still raise money to fund the Palm Beach County Food Bank. But it requires creativity to be able to do that. So we can't rely necessarily on the old methods, but rather where is God calling us? Um, the, The need exists and our ability exists. We simply have to think through how you make that match. My name is Clay Waddell, and I'm a um, a deacon here at the church. Deacons have a special uh, calling to serve the needs of a special group of people, and um, you have a calling to to serve in the world in a particular ministry um, to bring the church uh, to the world and also to inform the church about the needs of the world. I happen to uh, have gone into port ministry, and that was my initial what's called a bridge ministry. So that is why I became a deacon to serve uh, mariners, uh, which is my my calling. I was always brought up on the water and uh, going in and out the Port of Palm Beach, I'd always see these freighters and I'd always wonder about the people on those freighters, what their lives were like. Father Stokes, who's now the Bishop of New Jersey, you know, introduced me to uh, the diocesan school because I was taking a class here at Bethesda on, um, you know, Old Testament or New Testament. It was some class offered to a parish, and uh, he told me about the um, diocesan school. So I was going down to Fort Lauderdale and uh, just taking some classes just for fun and to learn more about church history, of course. I'm a history teacher, so I was very interested in that. And then I just loved it so much, I kept taking classes. And this all began in 1997. And I was taking these classes, and I just kept taking them. And then Father Warren told me about the Seafarer's House down in Fort Lauderdale because I was there all Saturday, and sometimes I'd have a break of two hours or so. 
And I said, Seafarer's House? I never heard of it. So I went down to uh, the port and got in there and met a deacon, Maria Jimenez, who was um, in charge of pastoral care at the Seafarer's House and um, fell in love with the ministry. I just I couldn't believe it. And the things that she was doing, she was a real inspiration to me and a real mentor and um, just fell in love with the ministry and started volunteering there, learned a lot there and saw that this was a national, international ministry uh, of um, a very small group of people worldwide, unknown to most, visiting mariners to this country and representing Christ, the church, as a, a person, a servant of hospitality and welcome in an unwelcoming world. My name is Daisy Alvarez. I am the general manager for retail operations of the church mouse and the shop. Basically, it's making sure that the premises and the staff and volunteers run this retail shop with the uh, procedures and protocols that we have put forth uh, in order to run it efficiently and um, successfully. So it's administrative and it's also all the aspects of a business, trying to generate sales and motivate all the folk that are behind the scenes to perform. So March 17th, we got the order from the, the church to shut down Church Mouse. We told the staff, go home. So basically it was trying to figure out what are the roles of the staff as their home. Uh, tell the volunteers, we will contact you. We've got, I would say, probably about 100 volunteers that we basically said were shutting down. Uh, the staff, the volunteers, everyone was sort of lost. Lost in that moment of pause, complete and utter pause. So that's how we spent March through June, more or less. In June, we decided uh, to, we had put some plans in place to have staggered shifts and have staff come back in small little pods every other day. So those that worked with one manager didn't work with the other. Sanitizing everything before we entered the premises and after, before we left. In July, we had another plan to accept donations. So staff had to sort of sanitize everything out doors before it came indoors. So that was that was a learning experience in itself. It was very, very difficult. The first week was nerve-wracking because the staff is eager to work. They were overzealous and trying to do a good job and do it very quickly. Who wouldn't want to go on a ship and, and see these giant ships and you know, especially if you're involved in, you know, maritime stuff and love ships and everything else. Who wouldn't want to go on a ship? So we'd, we'd come um, to the port. I'd come to the port, and there'd be chaplains there that were um, volunteers or paid at Seafarer's House. And uh, we'd sort of get a bl- blotter of what ships were in. Then we'd pack up bags of things like National Geographic, uh, tracks, forward day-by-day uh, We'd go and visit the ships and uh, come on board, and uh, we'd be welcomed on these ships. Uh, Sometimes there'd be some suspicion because, like, there are other agencies there coming on board to sell them things and, you know, maybe try and take their money. And we're just there to, hey, how you doing? We're just here to give you stuff, and it's free, and and we're concerned about you. We want to know your name and you know, how you're doing and talk about your families. And they'd ask about our families. It was, it was just a fun time. And uh, they'd only have 15 minutes, but we'd just come there and say hi and all that and tell them about 
seafarer's house that we had vans that would come and pick them up when they got off their shifts and they could go and come to the seafarer's house and um, sometimes there's family problems and financial problems and kid problems and everything else and they just need someone to listen and so it's a a big part of seafair ministry is just a ministry of presence occasionally uh, we'd actually have a service if the crew uh, requested it or the captain requested it talk about a morale builder um, the way that makes people feel and and you'd have people say you know I haven't had communion in a year and they really gave them um, I think courage and the will to go on it's not just delivering magazines but there's a spiritual component as well that hey there are people in this community that know you're here that are praying for you and we we do care about you in an industry where sometimes the cargo is more important than the person <laughs> hopefully have learned in this is the essential nature of relationships that we all too often take for granted because we see everybody. We see everybody at church or we see everybody at the grocery store or we see everybody on the street corner or the post office or at dinner or wherever we see people. And we have become, of course, accustomed because it's all we knew about what relationships were. And I think we treated them too casually. I think relationships are really valuable and perhaps far more valuable than we ever realized now that we are separated or distant from one another I think the, the, the singular thing that we as Christians hopefully have come to understand is the absolute value of our relationship one with another. We live in a culture that polarizes and distances, and we have a, we have a, a unique ability to cast someone else aside because they don't agree with us. But, but yet, we're called to love one another as Jesus tells us to. And so this value of relationships is absolutely crucial and it's hard work. But I think perhaps the single strongest thing we've discovered is the value of relationships and the work that it takes to maintain healthy ones. How do we keep everyone safe? For the most part, the key factor was ventilation. So we needed to have all of our units working, also protective, those protective barriers, and then of course letting the staff know that they would be working completely with their PPE uh, all the time, all day long. Of course, I looked at the, the science websites and their recommendations, so I went by that. That was key to make sure that we stay safe. And if we were going to then think of our staff, because it is key to, to our success, keeping them healthy, but also if we were going to allow our volunteers, our vulnerable volunteers to come back, how were we going to stay, keep them safe? Basically, it was restrict the amount of clientele, make sure our staff is retrained to do things they normally wouldn't do to make sure we're all staying safe, and keeping our volunteers sort of in that protective barrier. Looking at this more toward the Christmas season is drop-offs, um, drop-offs of materials, supplies, a note, a note to the ships that we're here, um, here's my number, and you know, I'm going to do this. 
sometimes we get all caught up that, oh, we just can't visit. But there's other things we can do. Yeah. Sometimes you got to think outside the box and, and, and get like a care package with, with even just a notebook. Here's my number. Here's my name. You, you know me, guys, you know. Uh, and um, call if you need something. I'm going to do that. I thought, I can't be afraid because there are folk out there that need us to generate the funds to help them. Food insecurity is coming fast and furious, even more prevalent every day. Shelter. So for me, it was, you need to be brave. You need to figure this out. And if others have done it, well, then you've had this pause to really adapt, adapt to the point where we're safe, we're responsible, we're helping each other, and that it, we need to step up. We've gotten the guidance from the heroes, from those uh, first responders, those frontliners. So uh, we had our education already. And I think that's what did it for me. We need to step up and be brave and be out there safely and responsibly. So I think the difference in what I want to do and what I should do ministering in this age of COVID is to challenge what I've always done, I think is the best way of looking at it. So um, ministry these past eight months hasn't looked like ministry frankly, for the last 2,000 years. We're so accustomed to ministering in a certain way that for me, it's about intentionality. Um, It's about trying new ways that I might not have thought about. It's about being creative to minister to a flock um, in the age of COVID. It's about reimagining what it means to be a church. The church, of course, is eternal and, and the body of Christ is eternal. But the way in which we do the things that a church does should always be constantly changing while we hold on to the things that are true and eternal and lasting. The way we implement that, the way we minister in the world, the way we participate in the world itself should be a part of the world. I look at a big picture all of the time so that then I could maybe come to some details that we can change little by little as we learn more and more. So basically for me, I thought, okay, you want to sell everything at first? It's it's not going to happen. The support is there. Uh, I felt a little trepidatious with respect to controlling how many folk could come through that space per hour. I kind of felt guilty because of the fact that we've had months, six months of calls. When are you guys open? Are you guys opening? Oh, we, we love your place and we'd love to. Now there's so much need. We'd love to come shop. So I know that people are so generous and conscious of the fact that they need to support this mission. They love it. I think that if we change in these ways, we're, we're safe, and we can take the success of the Mass to those levels again. The light, of course, is the hope, the hope that Christmas brings, the hope that the Incarnation brings, the, the reminder every single year that God is among us, and, and not, not abstractly, but rather truly embodied among us, that I think we so desperately need the important part is that we will understand Christ in all of us as Christ comes to us, of course, at Christmas. And I'm also looking for light in a time when we're able to gather again. And we will gather again. There is not a timeline on that. And I don't think, and I'm, I'm, I'm eager for that, but I'm not anxious for that. I'm, I'm eager 
I'm eager for the ability to return to be in company with one another when it is um, meet and right, as our prayer book um, uses language like that. When it is safe for us to be together for one another, when we can care for one another in person. And I do look forward to that kind of reality again. And it will come. I get nervous, so I... Oh, no. <laughs> you did great. You did great.